Good afternoon. This is Frosty Walker, Chief Information Security Officer for the Texas Education Agency. And welcome to the third in a series of webinars regarding cybersecurity. Thank you for your interest in cybersecurity and protecting the resources which the citizens of Texas have shared with our respective entities. To let you know that the next webinar is scheduled for September. Uh, we will do another series of three webinars in the fall semester and we'll look at doing another series of three seminars in the spring semester uh, of next year. Uh, there will be separate announcements sent out about the dates and times for those webinars. We plan on getting those out in the, the August time frame. We hope you find these to be very informative. We will allow time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. Should you have a question during the presentation, feel free to submit them at any time and they will get queued up for the question and answer session at the, the end of the presentation. If someone would drop me a note in the questions right now and let me know that uh, they are able to see the visual adequately and that the audio sounds uh, adequate, I would appreciate that very much. As with all of the uh, information and the tip, cyber security tips and tools that have been shared, they have been reviewed by the Data Security Advisory Committee. Uh, the, the DSAC is comprised of representatives from school districts uh, across the state, ESCs, TEA, and we have one uh, private sector individual. And as we start to approach the conference and symposium time, the summertime, I would like to recognize those people individually that have dedicated uh, uh, time and, and worked on this collaborative effort for everyone um, to make sure that, the, um, that, that we're able to accomplish what our, what our goals and objectives for that advisory committee is. Um, I won't read these names off individually, but should you be at a conference or seminar and recognize one of these folks or see a name tag, um, take the time to thank them for, for their efforts uh, in, in trying to, to make information security and cybersecurity a little easier for everyone uh, across the state. Um, many of us often feel that we're working all by ourselves on this. The reality is that many people are facing the same issues that, uh, that we're facing uh, individually and may have already come up with, with a good solution or may be able to put you on the right track. So collaboratively sharing that information is, is a great resource and we appreciate the time and efforts that the, those folks have put in. All of the tips and tools for the cybersecurity that the, the, the DSAC uh, committee has, has approved and reviewed uh, is available at the uh, Texas Gateway at, at uh, www.texasgateway.org. Uh, under cybersecurity tips and tools, if you go to that website uh, specifically, uh, you will see that in the middle, the bottom of the page, and if you click on that, that will take you to that. You you will find that this, as well as all of the uh, um, webinars, have been recorded. This one's being recorded as well. It'll be posted out there in the next couple of days. So um, we appreciate um, um, people writing in and wanting to know if it was recorded and where they can find it. That's where they can find it. Today's webinar um, has to do with risk assessment. And if you Google risk assessment, um, you'll, you'll get about 1.2 million hits uh, on, the, on the web. So we wanted to focus on something that was applicable primarily to the education uh, community. And we found a education risk assessment that is, was developed by Educause cybersecurity initiative and, um, and, the, and the Higher Education Information Security Council. So this indeed is something that was developed for 
uh, the education community. It's just the higher education community. It fits very well with uh, with most of our campus um, uh, complexes that, that that most of our school districts in Texas have today. Um, we will be talking about, and we the, this is a um, an Excel spreadsheet, and there are some scoring that's involved in this. It is all drop-down choice, so uh, it is um, fairly easy for, for someone to work through this. And these are the seven choices that we have to choose from on all of the questions except for one, and we'll cover that in, uh, in a moment. Um, first of all, we have a choice of not perform. This, this function, what the question is asking about, is not performed in, in in, in the environment. It's just not done. Okay. It's performed but informally. In other words, it's primarily reactive. If something has happened and now we're reacting to that. So it's performed but it's not really um, uh, just primarily reactive. Something that's planned. So we, we basically have a, an outline of what is what we're going to do in this with, with with this, whether we're talking about policies or or, or the different things we'll talk about, it, it's planned. So we've got an outline for that, but we don't have it well documented yet. It's not well defined, which is our next category. Well defined. Um, the 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 next category is quantitatively controlled, meaning that not only is it well defined, but we're also able to measure that in some form or fashion so we can take a measurement to see how successful we are at, um, at executing that. And the, well, the next choice is, is not only is it quantitatively controlled being measured, but it's also we're, we're looking at it in, in ways that we can continually improve that. Um, and then the last choice that, that, that will be given on this is um, um, it's not applicable in our environment. And I'll explain how I use um, um, non-applicable non here shortly. So first of all, I want you to take a look at what the first page looks like. Then we'll go into to, to some of these questions and, and, and uh, talk about some of the different uh, ways it's segmented uh, uh, so this is the first page. You recognize this as, a, as, a, as an Excel spreadsheet. It's got a place for a name, completing the assessment, the department or the institution, the date that was completed. If you will notice over on the, um, the right-hand side, there is a big, big blue X that says Reset Worksheet. So at any time you go, oh, I don't know what I, what I was thinking. I can, you can reset this. Not a problem. Um, we talked about the one question that is not uh, multiple choice with the seven choices, and it is the first question, and it is a yes or no question. And uh, it basically says, do you have a risk assessment program? And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Um, the, you also see that there is a, there's a column that have numbers of the questions. There's, about, there's roughly 100 questions in this. Uh, the next column is indeed the question. Uh, it also breaks it down into segments. Um, like in this case, we're looking at risk management, which is, uh, uh, and they're all related back to an ISO 27000 standard, uh, which is just an international standard. And then it breaks those um, segments down and it tells you what you scored in that segment and of course it'll give you an overall score at the at the end of the the, the complete um, completed uh, risk assessment. One of the things that we took into consideration when we looked at this was that of course it is educational and the fact that it's multiple choice so there's not a lot of things that I have to go out and try to find answers to and, and fill in a bunch of uh, blanks. So it's fairly easy to complete, and yet it does indeed meet ISO standard 27000 and 001. Um, 
On question three there, we actually have the drop-down box, and, and you can see that there is a little arrow in that drop-down, next to that drop-down box. You click on that arrow in any of these questions, and the drop-down box will, will appear. You, you click on, on what, your, what you've assessed your, your uh, value is, if it's, if it's well-defined or quantitatively controlled, any of those choices. What I like to do with non-applicable is I will mark something non-applicable if I need to do some more research on that or I really don't understand what that question is. And so I can go back and easily find those questions that I need to do a little more research on or, or need some help with. So that's how I use non-applicable because I think for the most part in our environments, most of these questions are going to be applicable. Um, you will see uh, next to, to where our drop-down boxes are, there's an item score, there's a category score, and there's a, a big red, uh, a big blue button with, uh, with a yellow question mark on it. And that is if you have additional, if you need help, then this will indeed provide additional help for you. If you're working through this and you have several questions that you've marked non-applicable, and you, you need you feel like you need some help, drop me a drop me a note. I'll be willing to to set up a conference call. You know, we can sign non-disclosures if we need to. We can talk about this to help you complete this, as well as well as any of our information security plans or anything that we've talked about. Certainly willing to work with uh, work with with anyone on, on trying to complete this. So that's the overall of how these look. We're actually going to cover the first questions now. And um, we're not going to cover every question that, that's in this risk assessment because there is a hundred, but we're going to cover a majority of them so that you'll get a feel. And what you'll, if you joined us for our last uh, call about information, um, um, information security program, you're going to see a lot of these same things come up and, and are related. So you, you'll see a, a lot of relationship between a risk assessment and, and the information security plan. But question number one, does your institution have a risk management program? And the answer is, if you're sitting down and trying to work through this, you're, you have a risk assessment program. How well defined is that risk assessment program? You're working on that, but you have one. At least you're working on it. So I would say if you're working on this, put a yes in that box. Num question number two, does your institution have a process for identifying and assessing reasonable, foreseeable internal and external risks to the security, confidentiality, and or integrity of electronic, paper, or other records containing sensitive information? And this is where in the, in the next column you would, you would choose your drop-down box and choose what you feel is, is appropriate um, in to, to in your environment. Again, this is a self-assessment. You may come back and, and, and redo these questions at any time. But in this case, um, you know, I, I've identified that, that I've quantitatively have uh, control over that situation and it scored me an individual score out there of four. The next question, number three, does your your organization conduct, conduct routine risk assessments to identify key objectives that need to be supported by your information security program. Well, now it's getting a little more detailed other than do you have a plan. So, yes, I'm, I'm planning on doing that. Yes, we've, we've got kind of an outline and we're going to do this on a regular basis. Again, whatever is most applicable in your environment. It takes those three questions and, and adds up a total score for risk management. In this case, it scored a, a, a 3.67. Then the next section has to do with information security policies. Does your institution have an information security policy that's been approved by management? If you have one and it's been approved by management, you choose what you think is, is applicable out there. It's probably either going to be well plan, uh, well defined if it's documented, or quantitatively controlled. Has it been published and communicated to all relevant parties? Okay, so in this case, when it talks about 
relevant parties. We're not talking about just employees. We're also talking about potentially of third parties if we outsource something. Because these are, these are your policies and this is how you expect your sensitive information to be handled. So that is something to keep in, in, in the consideration um, if you outsource anything for IT or anyone that, that might uh, be looking at or, or, or seeing any of your sensitive information. Question number six. Does your institute, institution review the policy at defined intervals to encompass significant change and monitor for compliance? So again, we're taking that a step further. Are we doing this at regular intervals? So do we, do we say that your, your information security policies need to be reviewed every two years? It, it just asks you, you know, at regular intervals. You, you can pick those regular intervals if you don't have one established. I, I recommend a, a two-year interval. Uh, things don't change that much in two years, but there may be something that does change that you need to, you need to change the policy. And, and at any time something comes up and you realize, oh, you know, we don't have a policy to cover that. We need to add a policy. You can, you can add that to your policies with, without, any, uh, without, a, without a problem. Organization of information security. So again, this is this is a different segment. You know, does your your information security function have the authority it needs to manage and ensure compliance within the within the information security program? So this is talking about um, you know the function. We're not talking about the person that's been assigned to this, but the overall function. Is there somewhere? And the next question actually clarifies this a little better. So I've defined this as well-defined. And the next question asks, does your, your institution have an individual with enterprise-wide information security responsibility and authority written into their job description or equivalent? So now we're not just talking about function, but we're also talking about an individual and a job description. That job description carries lots of titles. It could be a, a, an ISO, a CIO, a CISO, a CSO. A lot of titles that, that can be associated with your, your, your information security responsibility, but, but does your institution have, you know, have responsibility, one that's defined and in a job description? I showed that as quantitatively controlled. Is responsibility clearly re assigned for all areas of the information security architecture, compliance, process, and audits? Yeah. So now we're, we're expanding that a little, that role a little further because now we're talking about compliance processes and audits. So again, do we have those those processes defined? Are they well defined, or are they planned more like an outline? In this case, I showed showed a well-defined. Number 10, is there a formal process for having the individual and the information security responsibility access and sign off on appropriate hardware, software, and services, ensuring they follow security policies and requirements? So now, this person who has information security responsibility also needs to be involved in the procurement process. Because we don't want to be buying something that is very difficult to, to work into to our, our architecture, our information security architecture, your, 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 your infrastructure at the, at, at the school. So you want, you, know, you, you want multiple people involved, but your security, um, uh, information security uh, position should be involved in, in procurement if they're not already. In this case, yeah, I showed that as a well-defined. Does your institution maintain with relationships with local authorities? Many of you have your own campus um, uh, law enforcement. But this question is saying, you know, so if you do or if you don't, do they also, do you, do you work with, with local law enforcement? Um, you know, 
because from time to time you may have information security that that you're going to have to call in law enforcement on. So the, the best way to do that is develop that relationship before you have to make that call. That's all that's, that question is asking about. In this case, I define that as well defined. Next question is, does your institute participate with local or national security groups such as EDUCAUSE, InfoGuard, or um, ISSA? Now, InfoGuard is actually uh, is associated with the FBI, and in many cases, you know, local law enforcement, um, DPS may not have the authority when when we're dealing with 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 international uh, cybersecurity issues. So a lot of times, you may have to bring in the FBI. I keep a, I, I personally keep a, a very close relationship with the FBI. I've belonged to InfoGuard for, for a number of years and, and work very closely with the FBI, as well as my local authorities and, and DPS. Thirteen, does your institute have an independent security reviews completed at planned intervals or when significant changes in the environment occur? Independent security reviews. This does not mean that we have to have an outside consulting firm come in and do those security reviews. That's great if you have the budget to do that. But there's nothing that says that that has to be you know, a consulting company. You could sit down with the school district that you work closely with, sign non-disclosure agreements, and do a peer-to-peer security review and would that meet this requirement and that would. Human resource security. Because it is a risk assessment we're going to look at almost we're going to touch a little bit of everything when we read through this. Do individuals interact with the university systems? Uh, do they receive information security awareness training? You know, so when you have a, an employee orientation, uh, do you cover information security awareness? You may have a, 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 an information security awareness that, that your employees are required to, to, uh, to review and, and go through on a, on a regular, regularly defined basis. Uh, here at TEA, we do have a mandatory requirement that they have to complete an information security awareness training on an, a, on an annual basis. Um, so I, I um, you know, that just depends. So in this case, I answered that performed um, informally. Does your institute conduct specialized role-based training? And what we, what we do is a lot of times we, we have an internal auditor and they'll come to us and say, oh, we, we just did an audit in, in this division and this division and we, we think they're doing a, a poor job of, of handling electronic sensitive information or paper sensitive information. Can Frosty, can you and your team put together a, um, a training session that would specifically cover these things that we've un uncovered, and and we do that. We'll we'll develop a a, a training a more role based um, that could be based on what they do. Uh, we do a different role based for our say like for our developers that are here or our our folks that have administrative rights. We do a little different training for for those folks. Uh, yeah. Again, you 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 choose in the drop down what is most appropriate uh, for for your environment. Does your institution have a process for revoking system building access and returning assigned assets? So now we're beginning to talk about offboarding. Someone that's leaving your organization. Do you have a process? And most people do have a process. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna collect a badge, we have a set time when they're leaving, so they no longer have building access, have we checked off that they've returned all of the assets that we show were assigned to them. Um, so, yeah, in this case I, I chose well-defined. 
does, does your institution have a process for revoking system access when a position change or when responsibilities change? An example would be should you have a, have a teacher that was teaching, say, science in high school but now moves to junior high? They do not need the same access as they had in the previous assignment. So you, would, you should have some process that says I'm going to revoke what was you know what was specific to high school science and I will I will provide um, access to those that are needed to do um, uh, junior high science but again those those processes are probably in place at least at a well well-defined uh, 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 scoring the next uh, segment we talk about is asset management has your organization identified critical information assets and functions that, that, uh, that rely on them? So this isn't just about hardware. This is a, isn't about software. This is about um, information systems. So, you know, and, and we'll talk in a little bit about, you know, uh, disaster recovery and um, how we cover that. So this is saying, have you identified those critical assets and their functions that rely on them? And in most cases, you've got backups, you, you test those backups in case there is a situation like that. So those are fairly well defined, would be my guess. Does your institution classify information to, in, to indicate appropriate levels of information security? And again, you know, as part of those policies that we talked excuse me, about in the very first, you know, do we have top secret? Do we have, you know, secret? Do we have confidential? You can call them anything that you want to call them. You can call them sensitive. You can call them confidential, and you can call them public. It makes no difference what you call them as long as you identify them in, in your policies and and, and how the, the, that they should be protected. Again, in this case, I, I showed those as well defined. Does your institution uh, access control? This is an access to control segment. Does your institution have an access control policy for authorizing and revoking access rights for information systems? We talked about offboarding a while ago, and now we're going to talk about onboarding. So, so do you have a process to, to provide access? In, in most cases, people have a far better process for um, onboarding than they do for offboarding. Uh, just, you know, you've got somebody new coming in, you want to make sure that they have all the resources uh, readily available to them doesn't always work that way when, when they're offboarding. Hopefully it does. Uh, I, I chose well-defined uh, for, for this environment. Does your institution have a process in place for granting and revoking appropriate user access? So even in, in current jobs, sometimes things change. You, know, you may move information that's being shared Let's just say you move it to, you know, you, you might move that, if you're using Office 365, you might, might move that out to the, to the OneDrive. Um, so do you have a process in place that, that, that moves that um, you know, and gives people access when they need it? Again, in most cases, not only is that uh, um, you know, well documented, but you probably have some type of quantitative uh, measurements uh, around that. Um, number 23, does your institution have a word management, uh, a password management program that require, that, that follows current security standards? And I show this as quantitatively controlled. Most of us have password management program that follows our policies and we have some type of procedure of how often we have to change those passwords, the, the character makeup. Uh, if it has to have capitals, special characters, all those things, you know, we, we probably have those defined uh, in, in our, our current security standards. 
Does your institute have, have procedures to regularly review users' access to ensure that only, only needed pr privileges are applied? Again, I, I wrote this up as, as well defined, but, but you know, from time to time, you know, do you do some type of, of audit on some of your users? You don't have to audit all your users. You may audit a few of your users to see if, if there's anything that's changed or, or isn't right. Typically, you know, you, you can look at, a, 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 you know, 5% of your users um, every, every few months, once a quarter, even less than that if you want to. But, you know, do you have a process in place that, that regularly reviews user access to, to ensure privileges, uh, proper privileges are applied? I define this for, for, for this example as well defined. Does your institution employ specific measures to secure remote access for services? Yeah. Again, this is one of those onboarding, offboarding questions. If you have remote access, you know, you, you need to make sure that you've got something that, you know, that, that uh, covers remote access. When someone can have it, how they use it, those types of things. You know, some, some people may not allow remote access. That's, again, that's local policy. Uh, you know, I, I worked for a company for a long time that refused to have, have uh, remote access. But I, I think most people today with mobile devices have some type of remote access. And this is just asking about how you have it and, you know, is, is, it, is it planned or is it well defined? Um, probably one of those two answers. Does your institution employ technologies to block or restrict unencrypted sensitive information from traveling to untrusted networks? And this is, this question is a little, little wordy, but basically what it's saying is, do you, do you, do you have, do you have policies that says if it's sensitive information, it should not be sent over a public network or an untrusted network without it being encrypted. So, well, I, I'm, I'm struggling with that a little bit. Well, you know, if you have multiple campuses, but they're all on the same network, or if you use Office 365 and you're emailing that, those, those things are encrypted in transit. Um, most of your, your campuses where they're all tied together on some network, that's a trusted network. But you go to send that outside the school district. Do you have a policy that says, do you, not only do you have a policy that says, but do you have a technology that blocks or restricts that? For example, Office 365 looks for nine-digit numbers, such as a Social Security number, and will prevent you from sending that if you, if you enable that. This is, this is the first time we've had a question about data loss protection. But that's what this is. It's a question about data loss protection. I have something in place, one of my filters that's looking for different formats of sensitive information. In this case, I, I said, we, you know, it's planned. So I've got some of it in place, but I may not be covering all of my bases here. But I, I chose plan for, for them. Does your, your institute have mechanisms in place to manage digital identities, accounts, keys, tokens, throughout their life cycle? From, from the time, you know, from registration, from the time somebody says, I need a token, a token is typically used for two-factor authentication. Um, in most cases today, tokens are actually not a separate device, but they're you know sent to a cell phone. So they send, so you log in a, with a password, and then the system sends a predefined um, to a predefined number, supposedly your cell phone, with an additional code that you have to enter. You see, many of the banks use that. Uh, um, in, in fact, um, 
in the in the situation with Google last week. That was um, in your Google account. One of the recommendations was turn on two-factor authentication. Uh, so, so again, do do you do you have something in place that manages that if you use it? Okay, it may not be applicable here. In this case, I chose well defined. Is there a policy in place to restrict the sharing of passwords? Does your policy say users should have unique IDs and passwords? So, you know, ad administrator, not everyone should log in using administrator and the same password. And most, most policies prohibit uh, and restrict that from sharing passwords. And you know, the fact that I, I, I say to someone else, I'll just use it, here's my password and use it. Because that creates a whole different uh, issue. I share my password with somebody, they log on my account and they do something that is against the acceptable use policy, who's going to get blamed for that? Me. Because I shared my password. I actually committed uh, two violations in that. Because they think it was me. So, uh, Again, in this case, I showed a quantitatively control in our drop-down. Does your institute uh, prohibit the use of generic accounts with privileged access? Again, admin, um, you know, you, sometimes you'll see in databases they use DB admin. Um, generic accounts for privileged access is, uh, is, is, creates a lot of problems. So you should not be using those. Um, you know, so just review your, your security policies, and I'm fairly certain if you've got security policies, they will, uh, they will prohibit the use of those types of accounts. Does your institute use uh, appropriate uh, or vetted encryption methods to protect information in transit? Information in transit, we'll give a quick example. You know, if, if you use port 443 for a web application, that is using secure socket layer, which puts the little lock up in the browser, and, and that's what the banks use. That is, means that that is, is, you, it is encrypted in transit from the PC to the application uh, uh, to the web application. Now, additionally, the web application may be talking to a database server. Is that transmission also, even though it's behind your firewall, is that also encrypted? So you have to look at a couple of different things there. <coughs> Excuse me. But primarily, you know, when you're using port 443 and SSL, you're, you're encrypting things in transit. Does your policies indicate when encryption should be used? For example, at rest, in transit, when we're talking about sensitive or confidential information. And that should be in, in, clearly defined in, in your policies. Are standards for key management documented and employed? Key management has to do with encryption. Encryption uses keys that say, okay, now this application is used, needs that, that, that information in the database. Do you have the encryption key that, that gives you permission to access that? Oh, yes, you do. So there's typically, um, there, there's, there's ma key management, uh, it depends on what application you may be running, but it, it may vary, but there are key management to, to, that are documented for, for any, of those, uh, any of those databases or situations that you're using uh, uh, encryption in. Um, in this case, I, I scored that as a plan. I've, I've got an outline for it, but I don't have all my procedures defined in, in that case. Physical and environmental security. And, you know, we, uh, I think most of the schools uh, have, have very solid physical and environmental security. We'll zip through some of these. You'll see that all of these are marked quantitatively controlled. Does your institution data centers include current controls that ensure that unauthorized parties 
authorized parties are allowed physical access. Most cases in your buildings, you know, you, you've had a background check before somebody's allowed in. You may outsource your IT. Uh, in that case, you need to look at and see how those, how your vendor has that set up. And that may be in your contract. That may just be a, a phone call to them you know, to ask them. And there'll be several questions that you may want to ask your vendor that you can mark on here if you have a good relationship with that vendor. And if they're doing your IT processing or a part of your IT processing, you should have a you should have a good relationship with those folks. Um, does your institution have preventive measures in place to protect critical hardware and wiring from natural or man-made threats? Um, you know, a few years back here in Central Texas, we had a scam that was going on in a lot of the schools, where someone would show up late in the afternoon and saying, "I'm going to change out your your network hardware equipment. You're getting new equipment." Can you show me where where the wiring closet is? Somebody take them back to the wiring closet. Some, you know, then they would come back in a little bit carrying equipment and say, "I'm going to be right back. I'm bringing your new your new one right back." And they didn't come back. Um, and that's just an example. And and those those people were actually caught uh, and and uh, and prosecuted over that. But there were several school districts that lost thousands and thousands of dollars worth of worth of hardware over a simple, you know, scam like that. But not only only on something like that, but also natural disaster. So I can quantitatively control. Does your institute have a process for issuing keys and codes and cards that require appropriate authentication and background track background checks for, for access to sensitive facilities? In in most cases with the, with the schools, I think you do do a good job on. Um, do you follow recommended guidance for maintenance? Again, this may be a question that you have to ask your, your vendor or look at the contract. Um, but in most cases, if somebody's providing third-party IT support, they're, they're, they're going to follow guidance, or they certainly should be. Uh, 43, does your institute have a, have a media sanitation process that's applied to equipment prior to disposal, reuse, or, or release? This has to do with your hard drives, whether that hard drive's in printers, in fax machines, in PCs. You know, you, you know a lot of times stuff like that is, is sent back. Uh, if you had it on lease, uh, those hard drives may contain sensitive information. Some companies do not like you wiping their drives, but you know the reality is that you know you you really need to, to protect. Uh, any information that might have been run through that fax machine that's still on a hard drive, or on a printer, or on a PC. Um, so, so that's uh, something that that you know you you just need to make sure that you have a media sanitation process. And there are different processes. Typically, you there's there's a way you write zeros over over all that that uh, the segments in a hard drive for seven passes. That makes sure that there's there's no uh, residual, uh, and there's a lot of tools to do that. They're very economical. Um, are there processes in place to detect unauthorized removal of equipment, information, or software? Again, you know, just like, for example, like we talked about a while ago, somebody removing equipment. So the same thing is true with information or with software. You know, you, you go to the software closet and try to find Office 365, uh, you know, Windows 10 or, or something like that, and you can't find your your, your CDs. Um, so, do you have a process in place to detect unauthorized removal of equipment, information, or security, uh, or, or or software? In most cases, you have policies to prevent that. You may not have all the processes in place, but it, but you do have a policy to do that. I showed that as quantitatively controlled in this case. Does your institution maintain security configuration standards for information systems and applications? Again, this has to do with workstations. You, you, know, you have a, an image that's applied, and the same thing is true with servers. Um, 
The same thing is true, you know, with uh, with applications. You 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 do you, you know what those configurations should be on that application, and that correlates with the next question, which does are changes to information systems tested, authorized, and reported? So you do you have a change management process? You know, if you've got a benchmark of how those work, then you know, and then you you have an, a a change management process in place. It gives you a, a much easier path of tracking changes, and if something isn't broken, what what might have changed to that, that, that caused that not to work properly? Um, are our duties significantly segmented to ensure unintentional or unauthorized modification of information uh, detected? <coughs> Excuse me. So someone's in making a change that they're authorized to change, and they look and go, oh, golly, I think I know what's wrong with that program. I can fix it too. Well, they were only approved to do what they were what was approved. And they should not be doing anything else in there. So again, those are just processes in, in, in place to prevent unauthorized modification. Are production systems separated from other stages of development life cycle? Do you have a development and a, uh, a test environment? Again, does your third party have those environments? Um, 49, does your institution have a process in place to monitor the utilization of key system resources and mitigate the uh, risk management downtime? You know, somebody says they, they'll provide you with, with five nines uh, in, of, of a SLA, but do they have the processes in place to, to make sure that they can meet those? And if you do, and that's your objective to provide that, then you should have those in place. Our methods used to detect, quarantine, and eradicate known malware uh, or malicious code in information systems, including workstations, servers, and mobile computing devices. This, is, this has to do with viruses and, and, and malware. Do you have something in place? In this case, I scored, scored it as a quantitatively controlled. Um, our methods used to detect and eradicate uh, malicious code in email on the web and our removable media. Again, we're talking antivirus, malware detection. Is your backup, is your data backup process frequently consistent with the availability requirements of your organization? So basically what that's saying, how often do you take your backups and does that meet the requirements uh, of your, your strategic plan for your organization? And it, those backups should meet those requirements. In this case, I showed that as well defined. Does your institute require the use of, of confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements for employees or third parties? Yeah. I, I certainly recommend that we do have those. Does your institution routinely test and restore your, your restore product procedures? At least on an annual basis, do you do a disaster recovery of an application? Do you test your backups from time to time, at least quarterly, to make sure you're getting good backups? Those are those are critical pieces of uh, 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 of operations. Does your institution continuously monitor your wired and wireless networks for unauthorized access? Do you have a log? Can you do, you know can somebody look at that log from time to time? Um, does your institutes have policies and procedures in place to protect exchanged information from interception, copying, modification, misdirecting, or, or destruction? You know, this is one of those that you may want to put a, a uh, non-applicable at and take a, take a little little harder look at. Uh, may want to want to look at the, uh, the the question button over there. Uh, but most people have some type of policies and procedures in place for, for exchanged information. Um, does your institution ensure that users access is um, diagnostic and, and configuration ports is restricted to authorized individuals and applications? 
So people accessing it, um, you know, and, and diagnostic and configuration ports, is that restricted to only authorized individuals? Again, I, I showed this as, as well defined. It just depends on your environment. Does your institution employ specific measures to prevent and detect rogue access from all your wireless LANs? Now, again, you have some way of, of, of looking to see what devices are on there, you, you know, creating a law of, of some type. Does your institution process uh, validating the security of purchase software products? Do you have a process for validating the security of purchased products? Uh, again, you know, before you buy something, you need to you need to validate, you know, that that's a that's a, a solid product. Um, information systems or enhancements, uh, existing systems validated against defined security requirements. Um, yeah, you know, you need to take a look at all, all, you know, your information security systems or enhancements and make sure that you're not implementing something that violates your information security policies or requirements. In most cases, you know, your, your teams are all working together, understand what those, those requirements and, and, and uh, policies are. Um, I'm going to skip down to number 75 just, just uh, for a time process. Are processes in place to check whether message integrity is required? Um, that, that has to do, again, you may put a, an ENA out there. It may be a, a thought of in most cases as an application issue or message integrity. I'm sending, uh, I'm, I'm sending, you know, somebody's sending me something. Am I, am I receiving what was sent? Uh, in your application. Um, incorrect output may occur. Again, this has to do with the integrity of, uh, of information, uh, even in tested systems. Does your institution have a, a, a validation? Do you have validation checks to ensure that data output is as expected? Most cases, applications, you're buying something off the shelf, it, it, it should have, but that may be a question that you want to ask that vendor. Uh, have you established processes for obtaining source code, to, uh, maintaining source code during the life cycle and while in production to reduce the risk of software corruption? So, yeah, when you're making modification to that, are you keeping keeping that in a, in a for example, a software vault that uh, would maintain the, uh, the integrity of that? Should should something happen, production suddenly stops working? Go back to the vault, and pull up the last version that, that you you deployed, and and, and you should have that um, that process in, in place. We're getting very close here to the end, so we we're only going to have about five minutes for questions. But uh, this we are covering a lot today, so I apologize for that. But if there's any questions we don't get to, uh, we'll send out uh, we'll, we'll add those to our frequently answered questions. Um, does your institution have specific security requirements in contracts with external third parties granting access to sensitive information? You know, you, we talk about third parties, but this is this is a key part. You, you know, you, you're you're having someone else do something with sensitive information. You need to make sure that you have security requirements in place to protect protect that information, just as if it was someone in house doing that work or reviewing that data. Are requirements addressed and uh, remediated prior to granting access to data, uh, data assets, and information systems? So, now, are you testing? Are you testing and, and remediating things prior to, to, to giving access to the data to a supplier? Um, ag do agreements for external information system services specifically specify appropriate security requirements. Again, they should be meeting your security policies, not theirs. They're, working, they're doing your data, so they, you should be able to, to come up with some agreement in a contract to protect those, those resources, um, just like they were, they were being, uh, you, were, you were handling those in-house. 
does, does your institution have a process in place for assessing that external information system providers comply with appropriate security um, requirements? For example, do you have the right to audit how they're doing something? That's always should be included in, in your contracts when you're, when you're dealing with third parties. Again, that should be a part of your, your, uh, your process, uh, your procurement process, and well-defined. Um, are external information system uh, agreements executed and routinely, 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 excuse me, routinely reviewed to ensure security requirements are current? So again, you know, in that contract period, do you have the ability to, to review to make sure that they're in compliance with your security standards? Uh, I scored that as well defined, but it's dependent on your environment. Um, are inc incident handling procedures in place to report and, and respond to security incident, incidents throughout an incident life cycle, including the definition, roles, and responsibilities? And I will say, you know, that we are going to have a webinar on uh, incident handling. That may be our, it'll be September or October, but it'll be in our fall series. We will talk specifically about the uh, incident handling. Um, again, you should have that in writing and, and documented. Um, your incident response staff aware of legal and compliance requirements surrounding evidence of collection. Um, yeah, this is where if you had a, had a potential breach of data, you may want to bring in an outside consulting firm to handle the forensics on that so that so that, that data doesn't get tainted. You might be able to use that in a court case. Um, you know, again, that's you know, you either educate your staff on on the legal and compliance requirements or you uh, you bring in a third party to, to do that. Um, does your institution have documented business continuity plan for information technology? Is it based on business impact analysis? Is it tested? Is it reviewed? And is it, and is it approved by senior staff or, or board of trustees? And so again, those are just those are pretty common things within uh, business continuity plans. But you know, it's just asking you to, to verify that. In this case, I said it was well defined. I am going to skip down to question number 97 because um, this question raised concern for me and I wanted to, to, to give an example. So number 97 says, does your institute provide guidance for the community on export control laws? I'm going, export control laws? What, what are we talking about here? So let's go over to the question dot and see what it says. It says, are policies published on the website or in a handbook? It was talking about export control laws. So I'm going, okay, that didn't, that didn't help me. Now the next sentence, is there a well-known subject matter expert who can be consulted if questions arise? Oh, wait a minute. We were talking about export, and now we're talking about expert. There's actually a typo in this uh, in, in this um, uh, assessment, and we have corrected that in our version. If you download it from from the TEA website, we are correcting that. But should you download that from the Educause, you'll you will still see the expert. So, you know, reading questions um, help a lot sometimes. Um, so that was uh, question number 97. Um, now, and, and then we, they also talk about, are you performing uh, independent audits on information systems? Um, uh, so, so, you know, audits on information systems to identify strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, so hopefully uh, when, you, when you finish this uh, information assessment, It'll, it will help you identify where you, where, you, where you have lower scores. You go, hmm, I, I need to look at, I need to look at how, how can I improve those. So, so the same thing is true when it's talking about audits. Uh, you're looking for strengths and weaknesses. And most of us, 
yes, we do have audits. Our audit tools properly separated from development and operational uh, environment to prevent misuse or compromise. And this has to do with, with audit tools that you're using, you know, much like security tools. If you were using those in a um, in your IT shop, you know, you also have those sep separated between your development and your operation or your production to make sure that there's not any misuse or somebody can't go in and change the logs and compromise those audit tools. Um, so that is actually, there is 101 questions on that. At the end of this, it gives you an overall rating. Again, you know, the, when, when the DSAC reviewed this, thing that we thought it was educationally uh, focused and it was um, uh, multiple choice questions makes it easier to uh, um, to work through than one that, that you have to answer uh, independent questions. And speaking of questions at this time, I will start to address questions that we have here. Looks like um, I'm reading through questions. Good question. Do you have examples of security contracts for external third-party vendors? And we will add that to our DSAC list uh, to see if we can come up with some samples of, of security contracts for external third-party uh, vendors. I think that is a very, very good good point. I think that's something that, that everybody faces. We deal with third party, looking more at the cloud. I think those all are uh, examples. Um, we're just about to run out of time, it looks like. So with that, uh, yeah, and, and anyone can feel free to reach out to me at any time. Uh, I, I put my my uh, phone number and my email on the first uh, contact. I'll go back and show people that just in case we'll zip through that. If there's any any questions, please reach out to me. There's my email and there's my phone number if anybody needs it. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up today. And I appreciate your attendance and thank you for showing interest in uh, cybersecurity and and attending today. We will get this uh, recording out in the next couple of days on the um, texasgateway.org uh, site for anybody that needs to review it. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all very much.